Okay, we're just starting to let a few people into the lobby there currently as as we're going trying to kick the meeting off. So we'll just give it uh, a sort of few minutes and then we'll we'll kick in just while people are being uh, admitted into the lobby. Okay, just got a few more people coming into the meeting now. So uh, once again, we'll just just give it another minute and then we'll we'll kick off into our uh, our presentation. Okay, that looks like everyone's been admitted in. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name's Brett Littler. I'm a senior land service officer with the local land services. Um, and I'm part of the Saving Our Soils During Drought program. Uh, I'll be your host for tonight's webinar. Uh, so welcome to tonight's event and thank you for taking the time to join with us. Um, before I kick into gear, I'd just like to acknowledge country. Uh, we pay our respects to the elders past, present and, and uh, emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people their culture and connections with the lands and waters of New South Wales. Also, whenever we're, we're doing this, we've really got to acknowledge the, the funding sources and, and the funding for tonight's webinar has been brought to you by Saving Our Soils During Drought Program. This project received funding from the Southern New South Wales Drought and Innovation Hub and is part of the New South Wales, well, the Australian Government's Future Drought Fund. Also, just to help with just a little bit of housekeeping here tonight. If you can please, um, you know, obviously I know we've got some people who've um, joined via their phone and the like. Uh, I know with the webinar that we had last week that caused a few little issues and does affect some of the functionality where people try and ask questions. And, and I had a couple of people that I know sending me texts. So just if you can, you, you are better off being on a desktop. Uh, uh, just helps also with with the network. Uh, attendees, if you who want to ask questions, you've got the option to to submit questions. Uh, they they come in, we go through those questions, and rather than trying to give them all to to John at, at once and 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 the like, we try to amalgamate them up so that we get that common theme. Um, because I know last week, for example, I had six, seven questions that were all all around the same thing. So, save trying to, you know, sort of ask the same question five different ways to John. Uh, we'll, we'll actually just uh, group those questions up. Uh, if I don't do it justice or there's any issues, please feel, feel free to miss, resubmit those questions and, and we can go, go from there. Um, also, what I would ask that if you can take time to fill out the the post event evaluation form, uh, which we will be emailing out. It's pretty important and, and it's 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 something that we rely on as part of our funding and the like. Um, so obviously tonight's webinar, uh, we've got Making the Most of Sur Surplus Feed with John Francis. John is a director and consultant with Arista. Uh, it's an agricultural consultancy focused on improving farm business performance. Uh, John's got a bit of a varied background. He had, was part of agricultural production and also worked in as an, uh, an agronomist for over 10 years um, and has a real strong focus in farm business and management and analytical skills of, of those businesses. So without further ado, I'll, I'll hand over to John and, and thanks very, very much for joining us here this evening and sharing your knowledge. No worries. Thanks very much, Brett. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, it's I am really what I'm most impressed about, without even having started, is the fact that we're here on um, on a on drought management funding, and we're talking about um, surplus feed. And the reason I'm really impressed about that is that a lot of the resilience built into businesses is a function of using the feed when it's there in the good times as well as managing things when they're not so good. So I think we do an exceptional job of um, managing things in the in the years where there's not so much um, and obviously there's some challenges there 
with regards to finances and emotional stress and those sorts of things. But what we probably don't do quite so well is take the opportunities when there is surplus feed and um, those opportunities are particularly important to capture because effectively what they do is insulate you against um, the poor years. So I will talk uh, largely conceptually tonight. I'm not going to talk to detail because I know we're going New South Wales wide and I know that if I dig too much in, in, in a little bit of detail in one area, um, someone will miss out. So I'll use uh, sort of case studies or concepts that hopefully will be broadly applicable to everyone this evening. But um, I always like to start with a story and uh, this story um, involves a bit of risk because I'm, uh, I'm talking about my wife uh, and it's all about difference. So um, my wife and I are very different beings. She gets her energy from surrounding health, herself with people while I get my energy from solitude. So I'm going to give you an example. We were on holidays up the north coast and she comes back at 11 a.m. from a um, from a walk that she left uh, at 6 a.m. for. She says, John, I've just had the best morning. I said, I'd love to know what in your world qualifies as a great morning. Um, so she said, yep, it started with meeting with three lifelong friends and we went for a walk but it got better because along the way we, we ran into different people and at least five times I had to stop and had a chat. Then we had three coffees because the people kept joining us when we we're in the coffee shop. Now to me that sounds like absolute hell. If I go to a walk for a walk it basically has a purpose and um, that purpose is to get from A to, from a to B um, and if I see someone on the walk I'm either head down or pretending I haven't seen them, so I try and get to where I'm going. Now, the other thing we're very different on is our approach to decision making. Um, my wife tends to take a belief based approach to decision making, while I like to think that I take an evidence based approach. So I'm going to give an example. So we'll be watching something on the news about someone who's up on some sort of charge. It could be a rape or a murder or a robbery or something. And she'll ask me, she'll look at me point blank and go, do you reckon he did it? And I'll usually ponder the thought and think, well, I've got no way of having enough evidence to make a call on that. Insufficient evidence does not seem to stop my wife from making a call. She'll say something along the lines of, I reckon he did it. So well, why is that? He's got very beady eyes. Um, so I can just imagine the commentary in the judges um, sum up about the beady eyes of the accused and so on. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is that we're all different and difference is OK. So, um, you know, difference is basically what will what will lead to outcomes that um, differ between businesses and that can be based on your personality it could be based on your skill base or it could be based on all sorts of things but what I want to do tonight is contextualize some of those differences and um, try and give you a framework for actually making a decision around um, the use of surplus feed and I'm going to start by quantifying what I think surplus feed is. So where there's complexity, context does matter. And if you think about how complex the businesses you're running are, they're extremely complex. We're talking about biological complexity, we're talking about psychological complexity, and we're talking about financial complexity. And when you put all those three into the mix, you can often get an outcome that's not particularly um, you know, wonderful for everyone because either something's dominating your thought process and shouldn't be and rationality goes out the window. So um, I've just framed that up by talking about some of the things that add complexity. And the first one is the type of system that you run. You know, when you carve or when you lamb or when you turn off actually um, adds to the complexity or might minimise the complexity of your business. Um, the next thing that matters is the type of enterprise that you run. I'll give some examples tonight, but it could be that you're running, you know, three or more enterprises in this livestock world, or it could be that you're not running 
um, any more than one. Now that adds uh, complexity in its own right. Um, the next one is the skill base. Uh, obviously different levels of skills are seen within any cohort of producer and the level of skill that you've got will dictate the extent to which you're comfortable um, driving some of the productivity targets. The resource base might dictate, you know, the type of uh, enterprise that you operate or the type of system that you operate. Um, then we've got the personal goals. So this is the belief led stuff. Um, you know, you might uh, be prepared to give up quite a lot on the productivity or profitability side because environmental sustainability is your priority and you're prepared to um, prioritise that. That's absolutely fine so long as everyone's clear on your goals when you're actually targeting those sorts of things. Uh, and then finally, um, feed utilisation. And I'm going to talk a lot tonight about feed utilisation because I think it's the number one thing that differentiates some of the more profitable and productive producers um, relative to the others. And it's really that focus on utilisation that I really want to drive home in tonight's uh, presentation. So why should we worry about surplus feed? Well, um, we have the luxury of, of uh, looking at a cohort of um, around uh, $2.6 billion worth of assets, and that consists of, you know, over 80 farms. And in that cohort, what we do is we take out um, some of the more profitable ones. So we just identify those, uh, that little group who have um, shown to be a bit more profitable. And then what we do is we separate them and we try and look at their businesses to establish what it is about their businesses that actually makes them more profitable. Now, there's a whole lot of management um, uh, features around those businesses or those business managers. So there's a lot of skill base and those sorts of things. But I want to st stay away from the human element today and just talk a little about the systems and the type of thing they're actually doing to deliver higher levels of profit and profitability. Um, so the first thing that we notice from those is when we compare those to the average, uh, basically they generate about 50% more profit. So they double the profit of the average of this group up here. So there's a small group, if we look at them and they're highly profitable, the relative differences in that is um, there's 50% difference. When we take that to a production level, it equates to about 30 to 50% more production. Now that might be more wool cut per hectare, it might be more beef produced in live weight per hectare, or it might be more lamb produced per hectare. In all those measures, they uh, basically generate about 30 to 50% um, more production. So how do they do it? And the way they do it is largely this, that they utilise more of the pasture that they grow. We know that because we measure the output of the utilisation, which is stocking rate, and we measure that on a per hectare basis and a per hectare per 100 mil basis. Or more specifically, what they actually do is they waste less. Now, this is important because effectively, in some cases, Using more means really something for nothing. And that something for nothing is particularly important when you're looking at your business and looking for the low hanging fruit. Often the low hanging fruit is just using more of what you have. Okay. In terms of the value of that, it's basically to this cohort of producers, it's worth about $300,000 for every $10 million worth of assets under management. And given that the average scale of farms now is 10 million or above, or at least in our, in our data set sits at about 25 million. Um, so it's worth two and a half times that, even more. But if you just think of it in terms of $30,000 for every million dollars worth of assets under management, and then you think about how many millions of dollars worth of assets you've got tied up, moving from that low level of utilisation 
to optimum level of utilisation brings you close to um, $30,000 for every million dollars worth of assets under management. So it's not insignificant. Um, it is there for the taking, but there are some pretty big rules around how you do it. And there are some constraints in terms of the skills, the resources and the capital that's required to actually get you there. So I'm going to talk through how I think we can identify whether you actually have one of these, that you have some latency in your business and you have some opportunity to capture some of that latency or opportunity in your business. Um, and I'm going to show you how I think you can identify that. Um, so when we're talking about surplus feed, I thought it was important that I quantify it in terms that at least um, I understand what it is. Now, my definition, and this, this is not um, refined with uh, peer-reviewed literature or anything else, it's basically my interpretation of what I think surplus feed is. And it's feed or pasture above an appropriate target utilisation level that if not consumed, will go to waste. And I'm gonna talk you through what I think that means in a very big picture way, because I think you can get down to the level of detail and you can get lost in the detail. But what I wanna to do today is talk you through how you have a surplus on Uh, is anyone else's screen frozen with John? Yeah, he's dropped out, Brett. Okay. Um, we'll just try to get John back on online here now, um, if we could. Sorry about this, everyone. Uh, it was working all fine up until it just dropped out then, so apologies. Uh, we'll just try to get John back online currently now. So, unfortunately, we're just, just going to have to give us a minute while we try to get him back online. I do have John's slides and notes here, so um, I'll just see if I can. You there, Brett? Yep, got you back again. Excellent. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm a good uh, 10 kilometres out of Wagga, so, um, you know, it wouldn't be uh, too hard for me to expect um, service here, but... There you go. So uh, I think we're, have you got, what have you got up or can I share my screen again? Share your screen again. So we're right. up to what, it, what is surplus feed? Excellent. Fantastic. I'll share. Apologies, everyone. Um, the technologies uh, let me down, but that's okay. Excellent. We all um, good, we haven't, Brett? We haven't got your screen back up. So if you'd uh, share that that window again. Thanks, John. Okay. It's blind again. leading the bind, mate, when I try to give technology <laughs> advice. That's all right. We'll try again. Uh, I think I've got, hopefully I've got this one here it was where I left it. Have you got me there now? No, we Share. haven't. We... Do you want me to run it from mine and, and I can? I think that might be an idea. Oh, this is showing mine, but I think I'm using too much resources or something for the. Um, so, yeah, if you don't mind, Brett, that'd be wonderful. And okay. then um, I'll stop that. There you go, mate. Sorry. I will share my screen. Please. 
Excellent. Has that come up? Yeah, that's come up as um, the – we've got all the slides, but that's fine. Um, just to, so if you can just – I've just clicked on slideshow, so that should – Excellent. Right. All right. So if you just go back one slide, Brett. Right. So the important thing here uh, when I was talking about feed surplus is that um, it is above an appropriate target utilisation level. Now, the target utilisation level is actually specific to business. So I can't tell you what your feed utilisation level should be. I can tell you approximately what the feed utilisation level was of that really profitable cohort. But what I can't do is give you an appropriate level because it's very specific to your business. And it's specific to your business goals for a start. It might be specific to the types of pasture you've got. It's very specific to the locality. So if we're talking a rangelands type production system, you know, it could be 25% is the level of utilisation that you target. Whereas if we're talking a high rainfall environment with a reasonable long, reasonably long um, season, then it might be a 50 to 50 to 60 percent um, feed utilisation level that you target. And finally, it could be back to seasonal volatility as well. So all of those things are very important when you're talking about when we're talking about the appropriate target utilisation level. Now, I'm going to stick with the feed utilisation level at to, for the, the purposes of this uh, presentation of around 50 percent. I understand that that won't suit you all. There might be, in northern New South Wales, it's probably closer to um, 40% because you tend to get a lot of that rainfall in the summer pattern. That may be the same on the coastal areas. I haven't had a lot of experience there. But as you go into different um, environments, that target level of utilisation will actually change. Next slide, please, Brett. Okay, so... How do we actually establish um, how much feed is there? And I so I wanted to start by talking about what I call the feed cycle. So next, please, Brett. Um, so what we start off with when we're assessing pasture, and this is largely about um, budgeting for feed and thinking about where the feed goes. So if we start, we start with an opening amount. So let's just cast ourselves and I do this in January in our environment. It could be that you do this at a different time of year for your environment. And I know that in, in this part of the world, and I'm in southern New South Wales around Wagga, that we've got a dry autumn typically. And whatever I've got there in that opening pasture typically has to carry me through for three or four months till we get the autumn break. So this might be reasonably low quality feed and it mightn't necessarily need a lot more than low quality feed because I've built a lot of the condition in my livestock over the spring period. But every system's different. Next please, Brent. So the next component that we um, get is pasture growth. So we've got opening pasture, then we add to it pasture growth. Next please, Brett. So from that pasture growth, so Cumulatively, we've got what we opened with, then we've got what we grow throughout the year. But then we deduct from this pasture bank. So this is just like a bank account. We've got an opening amount in our bank account, and then our income comes in and we keep adding to the bank account. But then there's deductions through the year. Now, one of those deductions is the pasture that we consume with our livestock. And then the other deduction that we've got, next please, Brett, is the uh, pasture that's actually wasted. Now there's several forms of waste. Um, that can be urination or defecation, but it can also be um, the decay that occurs. That is anything that doesn't necessarily get consumed, but is then either available back to the soil microbes or is blown away as it doesn't have enough weight and so on to go back into that soil. So effectively it decays and is back down into the soil. Next, please, um, Brett. So 
the sum of those gives us closing pasture. So if you just think about this logically, we've got opening pasture, which is whatever's on the ground at the moment. Now I need a level of skill to actually assess how that is, how much that is. And usually that level of skill comes from things like the workshops that Brett and others run in terms of progress, which give you the skill to actually assess different pasture types and the amount of pasture that's there. Those skills are really important. And really all we do is go through the, the farm and we go over each paddock and we make an assessment of how much is there at a point in time. We then take a weighted average of that and that gives us our opening pasture biomass. We add to that pasture growth, we deduct anything that's consumed, anything that's wasted is also deducted and that gives us our closing pasture. Next, please. And if we've done this right, what you should have is if the opening amount is right, then you should have the same at closing given, of course, perfect in a perfect system. Next, please, uh, Brett. So closing equals opening, that's a very balanced system, but it doesn't always work like that. Why not? Well, we might get less pasture growth than we need and we consume more than we should, or we get more wastage, or that uh, we might get more than more growth and we don't consume a lot of it, so we get more wastage. So there's all sorts of ways that we can get more or less. Next, please, uh, Brett. Okay, so just a graph to determine what I'm talking about um, visually. So if you start with 2,500 kilos, which is over on the left, um, and when I'm talking kilos, I'm talking kilograms of dry matter per hectare. And that's a summer assessment in my part of the world. It could be a winter assessment or a autumn assessment or a spring assessment in your part of the world. We then add to that the amount of growth that we get through the year. And in this case, it's seven and a half tonnes of feed or 7,500 7, kilos of dry matter per hectare. If we consume 3750 of that, um, then effectively what we've done is utilised 50% of what's grown. So 3750 is basically 50% of that uh, 7500. The other 50% in this case is actually wasted. And then the remainder at the end of the year is 2500. Now, in order to achieve that in this system here, we've got a stocking rate of 12.8 DSEs or dry sheep equivalents per hectare. Now, the reason we talk in dry sheep equivalents, all we are talking about when we're talking about a livestock system is an amount of energy consumed. Pasture is just providing energy. We're converting that energy into product. The efficiency with which we convert that energy into product drives an efficiency in our business that delivers high returns or monumentally lower returns if we don't do it really efficiently. All right, next slide, please, Brett. Okay, so what's a system with surplus feed look like? Yep, go through, uh, Brett, please. So we've got our opening pasture amount, we've got our pasture growth, we've got our pasture consumed, we've got our pasture wasted, but in this case, what we've got is more closing pasture than we started with. Now, there's several ways that can occur. The first, the first of those is that we grow more pasture than we consume, or it could be that um, we waste less, but really, next please, what we've got here is a system where we've got closing feed greater than opening feed. Next please. Now the issue with that, next, next again, is that this part that we've actually grown more of at the end of the year, if we don't utilise it, guess where it goes? It goes into the pasture wasted. So what we grow is our decay and waste, and that's known as opportunity cost. Now the issue with not using the feed is that we don't get to turn it into a financial resource for us. And we've effectively increased the pool that goes back to decay or wastage. That's known as an opportunity cost. And I'm gonna show you tonight how we can move that from an opportunity cost into an opportunity. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so here, 
I think we might have been through that. Next one, please. Sorry. Yep. That's okay. Um, okay, so this is steps to assessing your existing level of feed utilisation. Okay, so flip through here. So first, what we want to do is calculate our average pasture growth. Then we want to calculate our existing stocking rate as a number of dry sheep equivalents. Now, the reason I'm turning it into dry sheep equivalents is because it simplifies the maths for us. Nothing more than that. It's just a way of simplifying the maths. And then finally, we're going to conduct a feed utilisation audit. From that, we'll know whether we've got a surplus or whether we might even have a deficit. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Brett. Let's keep moving. Righto. So firstly, I want to talk through some of the tools to calculate average pasture growth. This is one of them. This is the uh, MLA feed demand calculator. Now, I know you can't see that that well, but the idea was just to give you a screenshot of some of the uh, data entry points that you can use here. But what this tool does is effectively, if you enter a bit of data, which is up on the top right there, and you tell it where you are, it can actually give you the shape of your feed curve. And in, the, in that table on the bottom right-hand side, you've got the months down the right-hand column, which is, uh, or the left-hand column rather, January, February, and so on. And it tells you how much pasture growth you should expect in certain areas. Now, this is highly valuable because once you graph that over on the left-hand side, what it shows you is your feed supply curve. So what this is telling me in this particular case, and I can't even remember where this is, and I don't need to, but what it's telling me is at least 60% of the feed in this situation is occurring in the spring. So I want to have a system to utilise that spring feed. Next slide, please, Brett. There are other tools that you can use, and this is straight out of uh, the ProGraze manual, which Brett will have a lot of familiarity with, as will the others who deliver this. Now, this information is absolutely fantastic. What it's all I've done here is taken this straight out for, I can't remember where, at Southern Tableland. So over on the right-hand side, what we have is the feed curve. So along the bottom axis there, we've got the months of the year. Along the left-hand axis, we've got pasture growth in kilograms of dry matter of pasture per day. And that effectively gives us a range of pasture growth curves. Now, the range of pasture growth curves, you'll notice, is different. Some get very high in the spring and others don't get so high in the spring. Some get very low in winter and others don't your pasture growth curve will depend on the proportion of each of these that you have in your system. So there's no way I can possibly tell you how much pasture you grow on your farm because you may have a high proportion of the dotted line, which is induced perennial grass and clover in this case, and a low proportion of the red, red and kangaroo grass unfertilised pastures or you could have it in the reverse. And the weighted average of that is very different. So you have to develop the pasture growth curve for your own business based on your own knowledge. And I'm gonna show you how to do that next. The other bit of information that's really important here is that we've got some relativity scales. In good growing conditions, this bottom left-hand table is telling me that I grow 80% more feed in spring. Have a look how much feed in spring I grow. I grow a lot. If I get good conditions, I'm growing 80% more. That's going to be hard to utilise. That's a challenge. So you've got to be prepared for that. And in summer and autumn, you get 100% more, whilst in winter, it's 60% more. On the flip side of that, in poor growing conditions, you can get 40, 30, and around 60% less, which obviously uh, in, induces some major challenges in terms of the way you actually manipulate your system to deal with the challenge of having less resources. But understanding these and using these in a feed budget is critical to driving an outcome within your business. Next slide, please. So that information's available to you. Now, all I've done here in this slide is taken that information and tried to distill it a little bit. So in this situation, we've got three pasture types. We've got a Phalaris clover pasture, 
an annual grass cl clover pasture and a native grass per, per pasture. And they're all fertilized. Over on the right hand side, all we've done is multiplied the daily pasture growth rates by the number of days in each of those months and then summed them. And what it tells me is the perennial pasture or Phalaris clover grows around nine tonnes. The annual grass pasture grows around eight tonnes in this environment. And the native pasture grows me around five tonnes. Next slide, please, uh, Brett. When I use, when I apply that, and in this case, we've got 40% perennial pasture, 35% annual pasture, and 25% native pasture. This is the weighted average across that business. And now I've got a curve that I can work with to think about how much feed I've got across my farm for a year. Next slide, please. But there can be challenges or um, additions that actually change the pasture curve even further. And that is if you've got some dual purpose crop, you can see it throws a lot of weight of the pasture in that winter period. Now this is highly valuable, but again, you've got to think of it in the context of your business. If you only grow a very small proportion of it, you've got to think, well, how much does it change the dial on that light green bar? And it mightn't be very much. Or if you've got Lucen, again, you can see it throws a lot of feed in our environment, which is where this is, um, in the summer months. But again, if you've only got a very small proportion, it mightn't weight that light green curve up much at all in that summer period, and it will actually weight it down in the winter and spring periods. Now that might be fine, but you have to put all these in the mix to understand exactly how much feed you're gonna grow across the farm for a year. So this is a big picture sort of way we're looking at things, not down in the weeds. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's how we do it. We take our area, and in this case, I've got 1,100 hectares over the lot. I've got improved perennial grass um, and subclover is 700 hectares. I've got microlina and subclover here at 250 uh, hectares, and I've got red grass pasture at 180. Over on the right-hand side, we see an improved perennial grass pasture in this environment grows nine and a half tonnes. Microlina grows five and a half tonnes and a red grass pasture grows 3.1 tonnes. If I multiply the nine and a half by 62% of the area, plus five and a half tonnes by 22% of the area, plus 3.1 tonnes by 16% of the area, I've now got an average amount of feed across this farm, or a weighted average of 7.5 tonnes. That's how much feed I'm gonna grow in this particular case if I've got this feed in front of me, seven and a half tonnes of feed. Excellent. So we've sort of got a base. What I wanted to walk you through is how you actually calculate this for your arm farm. And sure, this is average, but you can modify it as the season goes along. You can actually look at, well, what happens if I get more in certain months or what happens if I get less? But if I know on average I'm growing seven and a half tonnes, that's a really useful number. Next slide, please, Brett. Okay, so step one is work out how much feed you've got. Step two is work out how much feed you consume. And we do that by working out your stocking rate. And I'm just gonna give you a bit of a, a, a means of, that I use to work out your stocking rate. Okay, so next slide please, Brett. Okay, so all we've done here, and this is a cattle system. It doesn't mean, I know you're not all running cattle systems. A lot of you might be running sheep systems and you might be running merino sheep or prime lambs or dual purpose sheep. I understand there's different types. Um, but what we've got here is a list of the classes over on the left-hand axis, and we've got the months across the top of this. And what I've done is allocated a DSE rating. Now a DSE rating just accounts for the amount of energy consumed by each different class of livestock on the basis of their lactation requirements, that is time of uh, reproduction, or on the basis of their likely level of weight gain. 
Now, a dry sheep equivalent just equates to around 8.3 or 8.4 megajoules of metabolizable energy, assuming these livestock are actually grazing in the field. Um, and it basically accounts for, it, it accounts for a dry merino castrated male sheep uh, and it's the maintenance requirement. So what this is saying is a breeder breeding cow equates to nine dry castrated male sheep. Or in other words, a breeder dry or late pregnant um, consumes nine times 8.3 megajoules of energy to maintain her condition. So all we're doing here is turning this into a unit of energy. Okay, next slide, please, Brett. So what you can do here is simply go through and put your numbers by month. So what we've got here is breeders. In uh, We've got 375 breeders across April to August that are dry. Then we go down to 488 in September. So we've got heifers coming into the mix and our cows going into the mix. That means they're uh, early lactation. So we know this herd is calving in September. And then they go into late lactation in December right through to March when weaning occurs. And that's when the 450 weaners occur down here in the, in the row um, halfway down weaners. Then from weaners, we know this is a feeder system because they take weaners go from six to 12 months, steers are taken out to for another four months beyond 12 months, and then they appear to be sold because they're not seen in the system any further. That looks to me like a feeder type system. The beauty of this is the next part. So next, uh, if you just tap that again, what you can do is multiply the column, the green column there, January, by the blue column there. And what it'll do, if you multiply 450 by 17 and 221 by eight and a half, it should equate to 9,731. What that's telling me is the number of DSEs for that month. Then if we do the same for the February month, we take the move the green column along one, um, one month, and then we do the same for that and so on. And down the bottom is the power. What we've now got is a stocking rate by month for this system. You can do this very simply as easily as I have just by running your numbers for your system here. And if you've got sheep, it's exactly the same thing, except you won't have as high a DSE ratings. Next slide, please, Brett. So what we've just calculated is this green line, which is dynamite. This is fantastic. We've already got now from a little bit of information how many dry sheep equivalents we've got. In other words, how much energy we're consuming from this system. And what you can see here is in this system, we've got a midwinter stocking rate of 7,400 DSEs. And if we've got 1,000 hectares in this case, um, 7,400 divided by 1,000 gives me 7.5. That tells us our midwinter stocking rate is 7.5 DSEs per hectare. And our average annual, which was the sum of all those bottom ones divided by 12, is 9,354 which rounded up equates to 9.4 DSEs per hectare. So now we've got our feed supply. Now we've got our stocking rate. Let's see how we use it. Next slide, please. Thanks, Brett. And um, that rough mug on there is just to show you that you can go um, to that website, which, uh, and, and basically there's a calculator there that allows you to calculate that stocking rate. So it's an Excel calculator. Uh, I just showed that if you want to go there, it'll help you out with the template that allows you to do that simply. Next slide, please, Brett. We'll, we'll send that link out to uh, people at the end of it. Thanks very much, Brett. Excellent. So now we've got our feed amount. Now we've got our stocking rate. Let's do let's do a feed audit. Um, and I'm I'm going to talk you through how I think we can work out whether you're optimising feed utilisation or not. So we, in this case, we've got opening uh, pasture of 2,500 kilos of dry matter, 
And in this part of the world, I know we want that because that carries us through the autumn when we don't get a lot of feed grown. Now, in your part of the world, it might be slightly different. We've got a desired closing pasture target of 2,500. So if we want 2,500 at the start, it makes sense that if this is a closed loop, we want 2,500 kilos per hectare of dry matter at the end of the year. Next, please. So that, uh, on top of that, we get our pasture growth, which is uh, 7,573 kilos. Next, please. Then you just add your stocking rate. Now, in this case, this business has got a stocking rate of 8.5 DSEs per hectare. Now, this is plucked out of the sky. They will have gone through that process that I just showed, showed you, but they've got a stocking rate of 8.5 DSEs per hectare. Now, what I want to show you next is whether the level of feed utilisation that they're achieving to actually get to the number. Next, please. Thank you. So the beauty, the reason I've calculated this as dry sheep equivalents is that a dry sheep equivalent basically consumes 0.8 of a kilo of dry matter per DSE per day. Um, now, that's not a precise number. It's a very imprecise number in so much as we know it'll consume probably a lot more than that when pasture quality is good and a little less than that when pasture quality is bad because they can't actually physically eat enough um, because the digestibility just isn't good enough. But if we multiply that 8.5 by 292, next please, Brett, what we get is 2,482. Now that tells us that we've consumed 2,482 kilos of 7,573 grown. Next, please. Now, if we take that and we divide uh, the 247, uh, 2482 into the 7583, next please, Brett, what we get is a feed utilisation level of 33%. Now, I know that in our part of the world, 50% is achievable. So this is telling me that there's a bit of a gap here because I've got a feed utilisation level of 33%. And if I want to hit that target, and if I want to set that target of 50%, then I've got a bit of... I've got a bit of work to do to make it up. Now, you may accept a feed utilisation level of 40% or 33% or even 25%. That's fine, I don't have a problem. But for the case of this example, we're gonna see what would happen if we took this up to 50%. Next, please, Brett. Okay, so we've already been through these. How do you set your feed utilisation target? Well, it's gotta be based on your business goals dependent on your pasture type and your growing season and your locality. It's also dependent on the um, on the seasonal volatility, the density of the pasture, the type of um, pasture that you have. So all of those things are in the mix. You need to work that out with assistance if you need it. Um, but certainly I can't nominate a pasture, a level of feed utilisation for you. But one thing that is important, if you're going to push this optimising feed utilisation, you do have to be prepared and that means very good at feed budgeting so that you can pull the trigger and put in a strategy to minimise the losses should they occur um, because you will have a higher stocking rate. So it's really about then building skill in pasture assessment so that you know how to exit early or you know when to build uh, reserves. Next please, Brett. Okay, so what's the target? Keep going. Uh, we've got 2,500. We've got our pasture growth. And in this case, I'm going to reverse engineer it. I've got a target utilisation level of 50%. I'm going to multiply my pasture growth by that. Next, please. That gives me 3,787. So I'm using the same numbers. I'm just manipulating them in a slightly different way. Now, if I take that 3,787 and I divide by 292, it should give me the optimum stocking rate, the stocking rate to achieve our target utilisation of 50%. And in this case, it's 13 DSEs per hectare. So we're well short of where we need to be relative to, to achieve that target. And so I'm going to show you what we might do to actually utilise some of that feed. Next, please, Brett. 
Okay. The other thing I really should allude to is that, um, you know, it does depend on when this pasture is available and understanding just how different pasture types. Again, this source of this is ProGraze. I can strongly recommend you um, do that course because it's just so powerful in informing you with information about all this stuff around how much an animal eats, how much it will eat at different levels of digestibility. In this case, what we're showing is that active green growth is typically very high in digestibility. And over on the right-hand side, that means it's got high energy component. And then as we come down to dry stalks and so on, we've got lower digestibility, which won't be as useful for performance in your livestock, but may be useful in maintaining or allowing some level of weight loss. So there's a, this course is brilliant in terms of matching your ability to understand what the livestock needs and what the pasture can supply at different times. Next, please, Brett. Uh, there's other tools you can use like GrazFeed. I won't go into that. Next, please, uh, Brett. Okay. So what we've done is we've identified that we've got a gap of um, 4,500 DSEs in this case because we've got an area of 1,000 DSEs, a uh, 1,000 hectares rather. Our target stocking rate is 13. Our existing stocking rate is 8.5, which shows that we've got a deficit of 4.5 DSEs per hectare for the year. So if we gross that up for the 1,000 hectares, our target should be 13,000. We're sitting at eight and a half thousand. We're four and a half thousand short of where we need to be. Next, please. Now, I've probably put this part in the wrong place, but um, I'm going to talk you through this now and then I'll show you through a, a trade that we're going to do. So, in this case, what we're going to do is trade steers. And I'm not doing this because, for any other reason other than it's a reasonably simple way to demonstrate how we can utilize feed and add value to your system. It's not a recommendation to trade steers, but you can trade anything. Um, and you may not trade, you may actually breed your numbers up, which is sort of like an internal trade in any case. So I'm not wetted to this, I just wanna demonstrate how we might actually fill in the shortfall. So in this case, uh, we've put a, a stocking rate of 10 DSEs per steer, and that stocking rate is reasonably high because these steers are gaining a lot of weight through the year. Now, that's, again, an imprecise measure. It's not perfect, but it's a reasonable measure. The proportion of, year, of the year we're going to graze these is, let's assume for simplicity's sake, we're going to go and buy these on the 20th of April, and we're going to turn them off by um, sort of mid to late December. That gives us about 239 days, which is 65% of the year. So just go back one, please, Brad. Oh, sorry. You're right. Um, so on an annualised basis, that gives us a DSE rating of six and a half DSEs. If I if I um, divide the four and a half thousand DSEs by the six and a half, it gives me six hundred and ninety-two steers. So that's how many steers I've got to go and buy. Next, please, uh, Brett. Okay. So what does this steer trade look like? And of course, um, I am cognizant that steer trades don't work so nicely as this. But I just wanted to give you a demonstration of the extent to which you need a lot of livestock in your system to fill this gap. So we're going to purchase these on the 20th of April. We're going to sell them on the 15th of April. There's 239 days in the trade. We're buying them in at 250 kilos and we're uh, selling them out at 450 kilos. So that's an aggressive target. That's 200 kilos of growth in 239 days. And Brett will know a lot more about the details of uh, just how uh, easy that is or hard that is. Um, but I just don't want to go there in this presentation. Uh, but if you do want to know those things, obviously there's support there to assist you. In this case, we're going to have a price in and price out at parity. Now I'm gonna sensitize this because I know that the first question I get will be, what happens if the price goes down? Because we're all risk averse by nature. 
So you need an average daily grain gain of 0.83 over the whole period of 239 days to actually achieve that objective. And we're buying them in for $4.10 per kilo of live weight and selling them out for $4.10 per kilo of live weight. Next slide, please. So this is what happens if you conduct this trade and it all goes as swimmingly as um, what I've got here. So you buy them in for $16.24 a head. Uh, sorry, you buy them in for $1,000 a head. Um, you then sell them out for $16.24 a head. Uh, the gross profit there is sales uh, uh, less purchases, which is $600 per head. Uh, we've put in $200 worth of enterprise costs. A lot of that is freight costs and selling costs. But And if you don't have those, your costs won't be as high. And some animal health and induction costs as well. Um, that gives you a gross margin of $405. Now, I haven't increased my overhead costs at all, which assumes that your existing labour force can run these extra steers. If it can't do that, you need to throw these in the mix as well, because this is effectively a partial budget. If we take that to a DSE basis, an annualised DSE basis, Basically, it looks like this gross profit of which is sales less purchases plus inventory change of $91 per DSE, less enterprise costs of $30 per DSE gives us $62 per DSE. Next slide, please, uh, please, Brett. On a gross level, what's that look like? Well, it looks like this. You need access to $709,000 worth of capital plus the cost, which is another $134,000, which is no mean feat. That's a significant amount of capital that's required. But if you have a look at the upside, you're earning $280,000 out of that trade over the scale of that 4,500 DSEs that we were short. So it's a significant earner. Now let's talk about the risks, because if I don't, I'll be breaching my duty of care, and I'm guessing it'll be the first question that comes up anyway in the question. So let's go to the next slide, please, Brett. Okay, so what I've done here is taken the risk sensitivity, firstly, just to price. So what I've got here is a sensitivity of gross margin. It's not gross margin per DSE, I apologise. It's actually gross margin on a gross level over the whole farm. Um, to the buy and sell price. Uh, so what we've got here is two buy prices. I'm buying them in at $4.10, and then I've got a buy price of $4.50. I put that in thinking, and Brett and I were having a discussion prior to this webinar where we were talking about how quickly prices rise on the sniff of rain. So if prices go from $4.10 per kilo to $4.50, you'll move from that light green line to that uh, dark green line underneath. Along the bottom axis here is the sale price. So if you achieve $4.50 out the other end, then you'll achieve a gross margin. And again, it's not per DSE, I apologise, it's gross, um, of around over $400,000. And subsequently, it comes back. So the point at which you break even is $3.00. So what we're saying there is if you buy for $4.50 and you put on 200 kilos and the price falls to $3 per kilo, then you'll make no money. But on the upside of that, if the price remains at $3.50, then you'll make $180,000. The next thing, though, is you're probably going to say, well, how sensitive is this to the number of kilos that I put on. Can you go to the next slide, please? And hopefully, yes, I've done it. Excellent. Um, so what I've done here is slightly different. I've sensitized to uh, the number of kilos. So that sale price should read kilograms live weight, not si sale price. So this is the number of kilograms live weight that I've actually put on on the bottom axis, not sale price, I apologize for that. So the bottom axis should read the number of kilos of live weight that I put on. And each, the left-hand axis is the gross margin in gross terms, not per DSE, obviously. And then I've just sensitized by different selling prices. So the first light green line 
is if you sell at $3 per kilo and you do 200 kilos of weight gain, then you'll earn roughly around $80,000. If your sell price is $4 at the same level of weight gain, you'll be up around $400,000. Obviously, those lines come back as the weight that you put on declines and as the, and each of those lines represents a selling price, assuming a purchase price of $4.10 per kilo. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is because I understand that the psychology is that you will be more worried about the downside than the upside. There's a fair bit at stake here because this is a large scale transaction. Obviously, the relativity is what I want you to think about. Next slide, please, Brett. Okay, the other point I want to make is about trading and how hard can it be. Um, this is now I've moved from cattle to sheep. It doesn't matter what we trade. It's really just about turning the grass or the energy provided by the pasture into a product that delivers us value in the system. Next, please. So it's pretty easy trading, I'm told. All you do is put little ones on, get them to eat the grass, turn them into big ones, and then next, break in the dollars. It's that simple, apparently. But we all know, any of you that have traded know that it's not that simple. Next, please, Brett. Here are some of the things you're going to face. Uh, delay in weight gain. Next. Carcass weight yield. If you don't do the carcass weight yield that you should, you'll get penalised. The genetics. How are you going to get the source of these? There's a lot of cattle in this trade. Offtake. Do you have it locked in or not? Next. Um, feed utilisation, you know, are you actually really pushing the levels? Do you have the access to capital or not? Next, please. Um, are you in a trading environment that's buy high or sell low? Or, um, and even things like paddock size, you just can't get utilisation in some paddocks. So don't underestimate the amount of skill it takes to trade well. Next, please. Okay. The other point I wanted to make, and I am wrapping it up because I understand it's been a long night for you, um, is that there are other tools to tell you how much feed you may have above average. Now, this is the farm, farming forecaster. And what this is telling me in this locality, down on the bottom left, is that already in this, in this uh, situation, and I can't remember exactly where it is, but I don't need to, the black line is where we are at the moment. Um, the red line tells me where I'm going to be in a bad year. The green line or yellowish line tells me where I'm going to be. I've got a 50% chance of being above that line and a 50% chance of being below the yellow line. And then the 90th percentile is telling me that I've got a 10% chance of being above that line or a 90% uh, chance of being below that. But the other beautiful part about that graph, and this is all from the farming forecaster, which is you've got access to, sure it mightn't be for your area, but if it is for your area, it's really powerful. Um, then what you've got here is the green hashed parts, which tell you over the long term what you expect. And already I can see that the hashed parts are telling me that historically we've got a lower um, a lower amount of pasture relative to what we've got at the moment. So we've had a good start in this location. The other things you can use are things like Aussie grass, uh, which is the top right, um, which is telling me uh, approximately the same thing. So in this case, we're looking at the current year versus last year and the, and the long-term average. And again, it's telling me a similar thing. And then if I go to tools like uh, the Australian Feed Base Monitor, which is available at MLA, it's telling me a similar thing. So it's the, uh, the purplish coloured line that ends in March, and it's telling me that's as high as we've been in this locality for that location. So there's a few feeders I can use to give me confidence that I've got more feed than normal, so I should be going a little bit harder in this case. Next slide, please, Brett. Okay, the other thing you can do is look at soil moisture. Top graph here is the um, farming forecaster. The bottom graph here is the Australian 
uh, water outlook from the Bureau of Meteorology. Both of those in this situation are telling me it's a pretty um, average or slightly above average situation at the moment. Again, just adding weight to the fact that it's a pretty good position for this particular business. But you need to do this for your specific area of um, the of the state where you're located. Next, please. Excellent. So I'm actually just going to, they're not actually take home messages. I'm just going to sort of try and sum up and give you a bit of a summation of where we've been. So the first point is, so you start by assessing your pasture growth. Do that on average and then look at, next please, uh, Brett, your stocking rate on average. That will tell you whether you're a, you've got a gap, a feed surplus that you can actually be closing the gap, gap on. The next is to conduct that feed utilisation audit. What does your stocking rate get you at the moment? Is it only a low level of utilisation or is it a far higher level of utilisation? If it's low, then there's probably some opportunity for you. The next is understand and set your target. And finally, next please, um, it's capitalise on the change. And that, I've just given you one example here tonight, which is really all just about trading. There's plenty of other ways to use the feed. It could be that you adjust. It could be that you do some backgrounding. It could be that you take a position on, um, you know, animals that aren't necessarily for weight gain, but might be about carving them down or lambing them down and adding value that way. So I'm going to leave it there, uh, Brett. Uh, I understand your slide might be the next one, but um, I'll hand back to you and really appreciate the opportunity. And I apologise for the, um, the issue back my end. No worries. <laughs> um just just going going through i'm i'm just playing with my screen i wasn't game to play with the screen up until <laughs> that point um just going through just having a quick look uh there's a if we've got some questions i did get um someone did text me one in there before um i have a question though john um it was interesting looking at some of that utilization type things it's very hard from my perspective, you know, we look at sort of some of those issues with some of that excess feed and you were talking about the waste and things like that. Some of the things that, that I saw in 2001, uh, 2021 and 22, where we had people didn't put the numbers on, didn't have those stocks on, and all of a sudden we saw, and I know Matt Lenski has spoken to you about this, the issues with some of the the quality of the feed, the lack of clover, which then flowed into poor animal performance and the like. Would you like to make comment on it's it's a bit of a statement or a question? Yeah, no, <laughs> it's a it's a very important point. I'm glad you raised it. Um, it, it. It's we saw the same thing, Brett. So you had this overburden of dry, low digestibility feed, which carried over from the spring into the autumn. Uh, which then meant that uh, clover didn't germinate because it likes bare ground and a big di or ch difference in temperature between daytime and nighttime temperature and the, the, um, the light factors and the phosphorus factors and the soil temperature factors that all um, assist in germinating uh, subclover seed. So we didn't get that. And that certainly did exacerbate uh, some pretty dire situations in later in that year through winter and certainly through spring where we saw levels of weight gain in trading livestock that were nowhere near what they should have been. So you're absolutely right. I haven't even gone near the cost of, um, of tying those sorts of things in because uh, that firstly, they're, they're hard to gauge. But secondly, if I can up this utilisation piece, which isn't always easy, I accept that. You know, in some environments, you get so much feed in such a short period of time that it's very hard, challenging to do that. But the reality is um, anything, any marginal increase will be better than nothing. But I'm really glad you raised that because 
Um, you're absolutely right. It was a pretty um, confronting situation when steers had previously been going out at 450 kilos or lambs going out at, you know, 22 kilos carcass weight in December, and they weren't close to those um, those numbers because they just didn't have the quality in the feed through the winter and spring. Yeah, some of the reports I was getting back, John, was uh, two to 300 grams a day on on cattle on on average um and 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 sheep i was hearing also you know sort of that 50 to 75 grams a day less that then flows into the extra time that they're having to be on there all of a sudden trying to get that fat the body composition a hitting your specs like it it was a real vicious circle that we did see in 2021 and 22 it just and just length all of a sudden people are having those animals trying to cover them th- carry them through periods and everything else like that it, it did did become quite difficult yeah that's um, right and i think an, a, another good point um worth raising here is is to actually do the feed tests you know so i, I think if you become uh, familiar with what what your feed quality is you then got a better handle so not just doing the assessments around um, the amount of feed that's there, but also doing the assessment around the quality of the, the feed that's there. And we could have picked that up a lot earlier. Now, could you have done much about it? Well, it could have been that you, um, you know, put different classes of livestock, you prioritise certain, um, you know, paddocks for certain livestock and those sorts of things. So there were probably tools that we may have been able to use um if we had a bit more information so i think you raise a really good point and i think don't underestimate the tools that we've got that are just really simple but not being utilized that well what one of the questions that we've had come in is adjustment versus trading john what yeah what your thoughts there yeah so uh, um, my thoughts are you get remunerated for adjustment um, on the basis of the level of risk that it um, that you're assuming. And because you've got no skin in the game in that taking adjustment livestock on, then effectively it's a low risk strategy. Um, and if, but if it uses the feed and prevents the issues that Brett's just talked about and allows you some income, then fantastic or if you don't have the capital to go and buy the livestock then definitely use adjustment as a tool so thanks for raising that i think adjustment is a really useful tool and if you've got good quality feed it could be that you actually you know um, step it up a little and go from that adjustment arrangement to a backgrounding type arrangement where you're actually remunerated a little bit better on the basis of the weight gain that you um, achieve. So again, that's where knowing your feed quality is particularly important because you don't want to go down that path and not be able to deliver um, the kilos that are expected. So, yep, I'm okay with adjustment so long as you realise that it's going to be a lower return relative to you putting the skin in the game. With with the um, caveat, that it's not always lower return. So, for example, the last, you know, 12 months has been a period where, um, you know, people have bought high and sold low, which is not a great trading sort of environment. And so there's been a lot of cash burnt in trading, but trading is a volatile. In the preceding three years, they made a lot of money out of trading because the market kept on going up. So I do think that, um, so long as you're cognizant of that, and so long as you've got a position around it, then that's fine. I think you've got to do whatever sits with your risk profile. So thanks for the question. Um, we actually had a discussion before. And I talked about a feedback sheet that uh, a producer brought into me today with some animals. Um, the importance of of correctly treating those animals and, and those animals that you're bringing in really important that you do set them up to perform is that fair enough too yeah absolutely i think you know the the uh i have very little exposure to um the biosecurity uh protocols and the animal health type 
um, issues from a tactical management perspective that people actually do take on board. But one of the things I note is that if you're going to be pushing high levels of feed utilisation, you've got to have all that under control because you can't afford any um, ill thrift in your livestock. You're already probably putting them under more duress um, from a resilience perspective uh, than you would have been doing previously. So it absolutely, you know, reinforces the point you're making, which is I have to have my all my animal health protocols under control. I have to induct them properly. Um, and I need to make sure that, you know, my biosecurity protocols have been met, which might be around, you know, introduction of weed seeds, introduction of diseases and all those sorts of things. So absolutely critical. This is a personal question here for, for me, so heads up, everyone. Um, so, you know, you know, part of this trade thing, I know I, I find it difficult when I'm, you know, there's, I'm asking someone to go and buy and chase animals for me. Do you have any advice or tips with, with that type yeah. of scenario? And I'm chucking you under the bus here. I'm really <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, look, I think, um, I, I, I guess my view is be very clear on what your specs are. Um, so be very clear if you've got a breed that you want or if you've got a weight that you want and if you've got a price that you want, um, provided the average comes back at that and you're clear about that, um, then out, giving that opportunity to someone else who where it's their core business effectively, outsourcing it to either an agent or a commission buyer or someone else, I think is fine, provided they're very clear on your specs. So if you're asking for a quality item with good genetics that's a line of cattle that um, will present well at the other end and they come back with um, licorice all sorts and yaks um, that don't meet the specs and are way under, then um, I'd say you probably didn't set your expectations that well um, to that uh, to that collaborator. So I think really, is it okay to outsource that? Absolutely. There's a lot of people that are very busy and it's inefficient for them to go and source those livestock. Um, but be very clear on what those specifications are that you're targeting. Now, that might mean you miss out that's fine, you'll just revise your specifications as you go on. Um, now, what are you losing there? You might lose a week of time. It's, you know, and that might mean a market increase, but so long as you don't, you know, the downside there is so much uh, greater than a few cents difference in the purchase price for the right article. Yeah. Along that same lines, and you mentioned it briefly there, one of the questions we've got on about, um, quality genetics to trade um the question was am, am i wrong in buying quality genetics to trade what what's your thoughts are they obviously you've touched on it briefly well so this depends on what your view of a trade is um my view of it or the trade i was just talking about is all about weight gain it's not about speculating in the market if your trade is about speculation then it could be that, you know, um, buying the, I don't know, whatever they are, that isn't quality genetics and all the rest, um, might give you a win. But I'm really talking, when I'm talking about trading in the circumstances that we're talking about at the moment, it's about weight gain. Now, to achieve high levels of weight gain, you either want crossbred livestock or, you um, or composite type livestock or very well bred livestock um, to achieve that hopefully um, have been chosen genetically on their performance for the target weight that you're looking for. So my view is there's not many times that people trade and come back and say, gee, I'm upset that I bought quality. Um, but the number of times that people have come back and said, yeah, I thought those livestock were cheap because they were, you know, um, I don't know, they were, I cut them myself at, I don't know, and they were 
run out looking things. Um, they didn't get the compensatory gain that I uh, anticipated and they didn't have the genetics that I thought they did um, or I hoped more likely they did. Um, the story, there are plenty of stories about the latter. There's very few stories about the former where people say, I, I'm really upset that I bought quality genetics. That, that compensatory grain one's a very, very interesting topic <laughs> in itself and, and, and the amount of faith that people put on, uh, I'm going to get it to compensate and, and uh, what that does. If people are interested, there's a tool that's, that's available is the Beef Specs Calculator and you can see just the change in, in weight at a given maturity and what that does to fat and then what that does throughout its life. And... But the interesting thing, that compensatory weight gain, they lie to everything. Even though you will get it, they still end up lighter at the same given time as other animals have grown. So, yeah. yes. Good <laughs> um, insights. I, Thank you, Brett. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, oh, that's great. Look, um, thanks very, very much, uh, John, for, for your effort here tonight uh, under trying circumstances. Thanks, Telstra or whichever service provider you may be with. Not that we plug a service provider. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but look, if people could um, help us here, there's a, a, a QR code there to help us with the feedback and, and, and the like. Uh, if you could please take the time to fill that out, we will be sending out, out a survey. Um, on behalf of myself and the local land services team, John, I'd, I'd really like to thank you for, for the effort here tonight. Um, but once again, if, if people can fill out their feedback forms, uh, we'd be much appreciated. And uh, thank you, everyone, for hanging in there tonight with us through our little technical issues. Um, I bet you everyone's never <laughs> be over saying, next, Brett, geez, Brett, back one here, hopeless, Brett, carry on. <laughs> No, I don't uh, think we can blame you, Brett. It's, uh, no, uh, that was firmly in my um, service provider's uh, sort of zone. So thanks for uh, accommodating the issue. I'm very glad you sent the presentation through to me. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks very much, everyone, tonight. We'll wrap up and appreciate everyone for hanging in there tonight. Uh, thank you, and, and we'll catch you around. Thanks very much, John. Thank you. Bye. Not all.